Recording has started, so welcome everyone. Um, it is a pleasure and a privilege to, to give the first talk of uh, the new semester. Um, I had uh, the opportunity to fill a gap in the schedule, so uh, you know me, I like talking about my science, and if you don't know me, then you'll know that by the end of this talk. And so I have some lyrics here from, uh, from a song that you should recognize, and if you don't, you're probably a little bit younger than the people who do. Uh, and as Yoris said, this is astroseismology, this is looking at stellar pulsations, this is looking at variability and the physics that we can extract from stars uh, from their variability. But given that there are a lot of new faces in the room, and I met you for the first time yesterday, I wanted to give uh, a little bit of an introduction. I don't normally do this in seminars, but I think it's valuable since we've had uh, 18 months off. Uh, so I'm Dominic, I did my undergrad at Birmingham in the UK, and then my PhD with Don Kurtz at University of Central Lancashire, which is also in the UK. And then I came here in 2017 as a postdoc, uh, and I've been here ever since. Uh, and uh, in 2020, uh, in November, I got an FWO postdoc, uh, and that's what my uh, project has been about. Uh, it's called Tesseract. Uh, here's a reference to pop culture that you should all hopefully get, um, and hopefully Disney don't mind me uh, trying to replicate the font as best as I can there. So Tesseract is, uh, stands for Testing Massive Star Evolution with New Astroseismic Techniques. Yes, I know the acronym is terrible, but show me one that works in astronomy, and I'm... I will, I will shut up. Uh, and what this tries to combine is, is various aspects of, of generic, let's say, massive star research. So there's a couple of consortia uh, logos there that I'm, I'm, I'm involved in. Uh, so the first is the TESS Astroseismic Consortium. So this is TASC or TASOC. Uh, this is based in Aarhus in Denmark. And this is all, all your test light curves. This is all your variability studies. And, and a lot of Connie's group and others in the institute are involved in this. Uh, Mobster, I'm co-PI of a, a, a consortium that is studying the magnetic properties of massive stars, uh, together with Alex David Uraz and Coralie Niner, uh, and we're using test data to identify magnetic candidates uh, from rotational modulation of, from magnetic spots, uh, and then we can uh, learn stuff about the uh, magnetic evolution uh, part of uh, massive stars. And then, of course, the uh, spectroscopy that we need to, to study stars. Uh, so I'm just going to briefly mention that CubeSpec is a, a project being led here at the IVS. Uh, but there's other projects such as the Jacob, uh, le led by Sergio Simon Diaz. Uh, there's Ulysses as well. So large consortia that, uh, that are looking at spectroscopic studies of massive stars. And uh, please connect your device or the projector will shut down in five minutes. So this is the time that Lucas steps up and tries to, to fix this problem. And I'm going to keep going. Um, so the, the HR diagram here, thanks, Luca, uh, the, the, uh, on the left-hand side of the screen is uh, an astroseismic HR diagram. Uh, and the green box is essentially the delimited parameter space of things, thank you, um, that I work in. So this covers anything from about two to three solar masses. I did my PhD on uh, A-type stars, uh, and I'm slowly moving the way up the main sequence. But I've also been looking at things like blue supergiants. Uh, I occasionally dabble in things like RL Lyrae stars and subdwarfs as well. Uh, but the green box denotes the parameter space that uh, I will be talking about today as well. So here's an outline. Uh, I'll start with the, the sort of physics that we want to understand better. Uh, what, what do we know? What don't we know? And then move on to some results that, uh, uh, that we've been doing particularly from Connie's group, but things that I've done since my last seminar, which I looked at, was actually two years ago, so I didn't do one last year. Sorry, Yoris. Um, but let's start out with some of the important physics that we, we need to, to constrain better. And one of them is rotation within stellar interiors, but specifically then the mixing that the rotation and other processes uh, uh, contribute to. So here's a figure from uh, Cyril Georgi's paper uh, using the Geneva Stellar Evolution Tracks, uh, just to give you an idea that the, the differences that you expect in how a star evolves, but this is just a representation of a five solar mass star from the ZAMs to the terminal age main sequence and then beyond. Uh, the difference in metallicity and the difference in rotation, as implemented in that particular code, gives you a very different path. And you can see here that stars turn towards the blue again, they return towards the red, dependent on their, their parameters. And if you then do a comparison of different stellar evolution codes, uh, this is a little bit of a, an old figure now as well, uh, the post-main sequence evolution of massive stars is actually quite uncertain. There's lots of different things you can turn on and off in different codes, different prescriptions for physics. Uh, and what we want to do is provide detailed astroseismic constraints for both main sequence and post-main sequence stars as sort of anchor points along that evolution to say, ah, okay, here is a very good example of a star that we can, uh, we can constrain its properties very well, uh, and that will then improve the codes, and there's a general feedback between the observations and the modeling there. 
Another important factor, which I'm not really going to go into today, is binarity. Of course, massive stars uh, are very commonly found in ma uh, multiple systems. Uh, and not just the binary fraction, but you've got the triple fraction, the quadruple, and the quintuple fraction increasing as you go to higher and higher masses. Uh, so work by our own uh, Professor Uxana has also shown that pretty much all of these massive, these O-type stars uh, are, are in uh, binary systems or multiple systems, and a significant fraction, if not the majority of them, are in close uh, binary systems, which means they are going to interact if they've not already done so. And so if you use your standard st single star evolution codes uh, and not include uh, any physics from binarity, mass transfer, the interaction uh, phase, for example, uh, then you're only going to be able to, to constrain some aspects of the star's properties and maybe not the, uh, the future evolution. And so here's a, here's a summary of, uh, of maybe the current state of the art, as I would understand it. Um, and in particular, if we, if we try and deal with the, the case of single star evolution uh, in the mass range of, let's say, between about five-ish to about 20-ish solar masses uh, with some wiggle room, uh, well, there are some very important things that astroseismology can provide, and specifically things like the masses and the ages of single stars. And this is a property that is so fundamental in astronomy, the mass of a star, but it is actually very difficult to, to determine in the single star case. But astroseismology, the intrinsic pulsations of a star, uh, because they are sensitive to the stellar parameters, they are actually uh, can be extracted with high precision in a forward modeling scenario. So the current uncertainties that we have for things like the, the convective core mass uh, on the main sequence, so this MCC parameter, is of order about 50%. Uh, and this is because of the mixing that goes on inside stars caused by rotation, waves, any sort of physics that you want to put in your code. Um, this means that there is an uncertainty on how much fuel the star has to burn through, how much hydrogen it has available for nuclear burning in its center. And therefore, it has a longer main sequence uh, lifetime. And this is about 50% uh, for this sort of mass range. Uh, and that corresponds to ages, uh, uncertainties of the order of about 25, 30%, something like that. So that's really the, the goal of what the astroseismology amongst massive stars is trying to accomplish, uh, putting important constraints on those uh, parameters. Now, I've mentioned pulsations, but just to, to clarify what I mean here, um, pretty much all stars in the sky, all stars in the universe are variable stars. That means that they change their brightness, and they can do this slow, they can do this fast. It depends on the physics. Uh, but what I mean by pulsating stars, these are inherently unstable to some sort of driving mechanism. And this can be, uh, for the majority of the stars, a simple heat engine mechanism. So it's the same uh, Carnot cycle that uh, behaves in your petrol, soon to be X petrol cars. Uh, and this means that you can expand and contract the star as if it is a piston. Uh, and in massive stars, this is uh, driven by the, the iron bump, so the helium, uh, nickel, iron opacity uh, regions that are near the surface. They block the outward flowing radiation. They cause the star in, in its envelope to heat up. It expands, the energy passes through, and then you repeat the cycle back and forth. So on the top left here is a, a simulation from Rich Townsend, beautiful simulation of some gravity modes, and on the right it is uh, a simulation of some pressure modes. And the distinction between those two is the driving force and the restoring force. So gravity modes are restored by buoyancy, uh, and the pressure modes are restored by the pressure force, so they're just sound waves. And we categorize them into these two main char char uh, sort of characters um, because they are easily to, easier to disentangle mathematically. So you have low radial order, negative, low frequency gravity modes. You can have high frequency, uh, positive radial order, uh, pressure modes, and so forth. The nice ability of uh, pulsations to probe the interior of parameters, I think, is best described by, uh, by the figure on the left here. Uh, this is a, an A-type star, but the, the logic extends to more massive stars as well. Uh, and because uh, pulsation modes are described by uh, spherical harmonics, uh, your simple quantum mechanics lectures apply to stars in the sense of the generacy between the uh, particular quantum numbers that we describe pulsations with. So what I'm showing you here is the, the amplitude spectrum. So this is a periodogram of a light curve of a pulsating star. And there's two colored lines here. There's blue and red, but they're just, uh, sorry, blue and black and uh, they are uh, denoting just how much data uh, have gone into uh, calculating the periodogram. But the separation between the five peaks here is a direct measurement of the rotational splitting, so the Coriolis force directly lifting the degeneracy between uh, the various uh, azimuthal orders of a per per pulsation mode. So 
essentially model independently, if you find a pulsation uh, mode split by the rotation frequency, you have a measure of the rotation frequency inside the star, inside the particular pulsation cavity. And if you have multiple modes, then you can actually measure the rotation as a function of the radius of the star. And so we've, we've done this now for uh, a few hundred stars uh, amongst the, the A and F type stars, and, and it's a few dozen stars amongst the B stars. Uh, and you can actually find that pretty much stars are quasi-rigid body rotators. And this goes against expectations of what we, uh, what we think they should be. Uh, when a star uh, evolves, the core will contract. It should spin up because of conservation of angular momentum, uh, and the envelope should slow down. But what we're finding is that for stars of various ages across the, the main sequence and beyond, uh, they are actually solid body rotators, which means that there is an unaccounted for efficient angular momentum transport inside stars, uh, which are not inside our models. So this is one of the examples that astroseismology has, uh, has been able to provide to, to theoreticians in the last 10 years or so. Now, that was looking at uh, rotationally split P modes. Now, I'll draw attention back to, to the gravity modes because these are very sensitive to the near core physics. Uh, because of, the, as I said, the restoring force being buoyancy, uh, they're very sensitive to, in particular, the convective core mass of a main sequence star. So if you were to draw out their kernels, for example, which I'll show you later on, uh, their probing power is really just outside the convective core in that, uh, what some people refer to as the overshoot region. And the nice property of, of gravity modes is that in the asymptotic regime, because they are high radial order, they are equally spaced in period, which means that when we have a look at the light curve uh, and we calculate our periodogram, uh, we can find a very regular pattern of pulsation modes uh, if we plot it in period. And this is what I, I'm showing on the right here. So this is a, a plot from Timothy Van Riet's thesis, and a couple of his papers have looked at this in, in great detail. Uh, and so for three different points on the main sequence here, shown in blue, green, and red, so points A, B, and C, you can see the corresponding period spacing pattern. So that's just the jargon for the, the difference, between, uh, difference in period between consecutive radial order G modes. You can see here the structure in that pattern changes quite dramatically as a function of the age of the star. And this is one of the ways that we can get very good constraints on the ages of stars uh, by proxy the central core hydrogen content. Uh, so you start out at the ZAMs, you have a relatively smooth pattern, and as you move to, towards the, the, the terminal age main sequence, that convective core has shrunk down. Uh, it's altered the, 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 the particular temperature, chemical gradients within the star, uh, and that means that the modes are perturbed, they're bumped, they're moved around, uh, and that gives you this more sort of zigzag pattern. So when we see, uh, without any modeling, when we look at these period spacing patterns, if it's nice and smooth, uh, we can get a pretty good idea that it's quite a young star. And if it's quite zigzaggy, we get a pretty good idea that it's uh, a little bit more evolved. Give you an idea of what this looks like for different physical parameters, I'll walk you through this. So there's three colors here, uh, so green, blue, and red, and this is for increasing rotation, uh, so as a percentage of the critical rotation. And this is a 12 solar mass star now, so something a little bit more uh, up the main sequence than I showed you previously. So these are still period spacing patterns, so it's the difference between period as a function of period. Uh, and on the left column, this is uh, what the period spacing pattern looks like if you increase the amount of mixing Whatever it is, it doesn't really matter, but there's more mixing inside the envelope of the star. And on the right uh, is if you increase the amount of mixing, whatever it is, in the very near core region, which is usually prescribed as, as either a, an exponential diffusive overshooting in Mesa, for example, or you can have an adiabatic step overshooting in, in, uh, in, in any code you want to use, really. Um, and what you can see here is that with more and more mixing, so when you go to top, uh, to middle, to bottom, the size of these zigzags also, uh, the amplitude of the zigzags decrease as well. So it's a little bit degenerate, so we need some fancy statistics to disentangle things like age and mixing and mass. But yet again, this is how astroseismology using G-modes gives you a good constraint on not only the rotation, the mass, the age, but also the interior mixing properties of a star as well. So the whole problem boils down to essentially a forward modeling problem that you have your observed period spacing pattern, you have your theoretical grid, and you do a forward modeling uh, to find the best match. And that gives you the parameters of the star. The reason why this has become so popular, I would say, um, and so successful, uh, if I might, uh, is because the, the long-term light curves that we get from space telescopes have actually unlocked the ability to detect and measure very precise pulsation mode frequencies. So on the top here is a, is a light curve of a pulsating star. Uh, I forget what it was, um, but it's four years of uninterrupt, uh, uninterrupted space photometry. And the errors are smaller than the point sizes by quite a margin. Uh, so we have extremely high precision photometry, 
And on the bottom here, I'm showing you what the, uh, the periodogram of a particular pulsation mode looks like if I use only the first 90 days, the last one year in blue, and if I use the entire light curve in black uh, in the middle panel. So actually, this, this uh, problem is like a Rayleigh resolving problem, uh, but in one dimension rather than two dimensions, which, which some of you are very familiar with. And so with more and more data, you're able to more finely resolve uh, individual uh, the widths, the full width half maximums of these peaks, and you find that actually there's two pulsation mode frequencies that are very, very close together. So this is why we need space uh, telescopes, uninterrupted high uh, quality observations, because if we find out that there's really two frequencies there, we can get a much better constraint on the, the interior physics than having one that's probably wrong. So that brings us to the sort of types of stars that, that I've been more interested in in the recent years. So again, it, within this green box, um, starting out at, towards the lower mass side of the main sequence are the slowly pulsating B stars. These are high radial order G mode pulsators. Uh, pretty much all, all of them are on the main sequence, but there are some exceptions. Uh, and they cover the mass range between about three and 10-ish um, uh, solar masses. The Beta Cephei stars are those that are probably a little bit more uh, uh, commonly known. These have been known for over a century. Uh, and these are actually uh, both pressure and gravity mode oscillators. Uh, and they are massive stars in the true definition because they have masses between about 8 and 25 solar masses about. Uh, and the more recent sort of discovery that we've been looking at is that there's a, uh, there's a new type of variable which is quite common across the upper main sequence, and they don't have coherent oscillation modes. They have a spectrum of generated waves, and so we've been calling these the stochastic low frequency variability, or the SLF stars. Um, and that's a very exciting prospect because if we are detecting not only coherent oscillations but waves, that gives us the, not only just energy and properties of an individual mode, it gives you a, a properties as a function of the spectrum as well. And so uh, I'll come to what we've been able to exploit from that information in just a little bit. But before that, I want to talk about uh, a little bit of spectroscopy, um, sorry. Um, and there's a couple of broadening mechanisms that are important to, to understand amongst uh, massive stars. Uh, and the reason why is because we think for, for the first time we found some good evidence of, of the connection between the, the photometric variability and the spectroscopic broadening parameters that we find uh, to be quite common in massive stars. So the, the most common one, which everyone should be familiar with, is rotation. Uh, so you have a simple rotational broadening of your spectral lines. The faster the star rotates, the less narrow the spectral line becomes, and it has this characteristic uh, pseudo-Gaussian uh, shape. Additionally, there is a, uh, what's called a microturbulent form of broadening inside uh, in massive stars. And you can see on the right here a HR diagram uh, from Matteo Cantiello's paper in 2009 showing that the, the microturbulent, this small scale uh, turbulence that we see uh, near the line forming region of massive stars, that it actually is uh, predicted to increase as you go to more evolved stages. So towards the TAMs, you have uh, amplitudes of order about four, uh, five kilometers per second there. Uh, and, of course, it's mass-dependent as well. It's also metallicity-dependent, so it, it turns on and off, so to speak, if you go to LMC and SMC stars as well. The other type of broadening I want to talk about is also macro-turbulence. So, as the name implies, this is large-scale, but it's also time-dependent, which is something that we don't really understand, uh, because you can observe a star, um, say, the next night, and the macro-turbulent broadening that you would infer is actually quite different. And the, the, the results from the observational studies, for example, led by Sergio Simon Diaz uh, in his paper in 2017, uh, which is the plot on the left here, uh, showing that stars have not only a broad range of macroturbulence, they have variable macroturbulence um, if you observe the star at a later time. It's a little bit hard to see here, so you'll have to go rewatch and get me some more YouTube views. Like and subscribe, remember, for those benefits. Uh, whatever they say on YouTube, I don't know. Um, there's actually a dotted line on there um, which shows you what the, uh, the best fit line profile would be if you didn't include macroturbulence. Uh, so you actually do a really bad job at fitting spectral lines in massive stars if you only have rotational broadening. Uh, so you need this large-scale, uh, predominantly horizontal velocity field near the surface of a star to actually understand its um, spectral lines. And this has been uh, related to pulsations, uh, because gravity modes have predominantly horizontal velocities, and so the connection there is, is, is quite clear. Uh, but there's also other physics that's important, uh, such as the subsurface convection zones uh, in massive stars, which get deeper and thicker um, as you move to uh, different parameter space. So it's a, a mass and age dependent problem. But also massive stars have winds, um, and this can be a time dependent phenomenon as well. Uh, so I refer you to Connie's paper from 2009 where she did uh, a very in-depth statistical analysis and showed that you can emulate the time-dependent uh, macroturbulent broadening mechanism by using uh, pulsations to explain the, the observations. 
So we have some evidence here that pulsations are, are quite important. So this led me to, uh, to try and find photometric evidence of, of pulsations in mac, uh, massive stars and try and link it to those macroturbulent uh, uh, properties. And so in the top left is a simulation of a massive star. You're seeing the, uh, the convective core inside a 25 solar mass star. You see the, it's in vortic vorticity, so red and blue uh, creating this dipole-like uh, motion. And the uh, edge of the convective core, now it's frozen, you can see it's quite clear to delineate between the reddish color and the, the blue region. But all in this air part of the simulation, this is the uh, radiative envelope of the star, you're seeing all of these wiggles. And these wiggles are the waves that the convective core uh, generate. And so it's essentially um, fairly uh, easy uh, to set up a simulation like this uh, in terms of the physics, because these, are, these waves are generated naturally from the, the turbulent convection inside the, the convective core. Um, so that we can actually uh, extract the spectrum of waves within the envelope and, and propagate what we think we should see at the surface, and this is something that's, uh, let's say, a first-order approximation shown in the bottom left here, what the amplitude spectrum of this entire spectrum of gravity waves looks like. Uh, and on the right is uh, observations of, a, of a, a star that we believe is very similar in its properties. It's as, as close to being a zero-age main sequence 25 solar mass star. Uh, with the amplitude spectrum showing on the bo bottom. And so we found that the, the, uh, the explanation seems to be quite logical, at least in our mind, that the, the observed and simulated uh, amplitude spectra look quite similar. And so what we also investigated is, is the physics that we can now get out of the simulations based on what we're finding in the observations. And one of those things is, again, constraining the interior mixing properties of massive stars. This is something, as I said, that drives their evolution. If you have a large amount of mixing or a low amount of mixing, you can keep the star younger uh, for longer because there's more hydrogen available in the convective core to keep it burning. And so we can not only get the amount of mixing, we can start to look at shapes. What is the mixing profile? Uh, so what is the mixing as a function of radius within the star? And the shape of the mixing profile is a very interesting topic within stellar evolution community right now uh, because there's lots of different shapes available. We need to figure out which one the best is. So we, we looked at a large sample of stars we, we, in both photometry and spectroscopy. We calculated what the, the amplitude spectrum looks like. We fitted it with this semi-Lorentzian uh, so we can uh, characterize the dominant amplitude and frequency domain. Uh, we can also say that it's uh, stochastic because these are not long-lived waves. They break, they deposit their energy, they perturb the local medium and then generate another set of waves. Uh, and so it's very noisy inside stars and, uh, uh, and we're able to um, uh, cou couple that information with the, the, the macro turbulence that we find in spectroscopy. And this is what we find. So here's a spectroscopic HR diagram. It's exactly the same figure, left and right. Um, the, the stars are exactly the same. They're just color-coded differently. On the left-hand side, it, the, the, the symbols are color-coded by the amplitude of the photometric variability, so this alpha zero parameter. And if you draw your attention to the green box, uh, so just focusing on the O-star regime here, so everything above about 25 solar masses, we find that there's this nice transition. Uh, it's, uh, it is statistically significant a trend, uh, but it's nice to think of this as uh, paint by numbers. As you go from ZAMs to TAMs, for example, the stars go from being yellowish in color to purplish in color. I mean, not literally, they're color-coded like that. And that means that the amplitude of that variability is, is, is larger. Inversely, now draw attention to the right-hand side, uh, the same set of stars uh, near the ZAMs are now purple and they move to being yellow, and that means that the frequency, the dominant frequency range of the variability is decreasing. So what is this telling us? It's telling us that this, this uh, amplitude spectrum of waves is directly pro probing the mass and the age of the star, because as the star gets larger towards the TAMs, there is a larger travel time for, from the, wave, the waves traveling from the core to the surface and back again, for example, and so longer distance, longer period, shorter frequency. And so this is giving us an idea of uh, and what I'm going to, to be doing in the next three months uh, in KOTV in California, so nice to meet you new people, but I'm going to go away next weekend. Um, we're going to actually now extract masses and ages directly from this. No need for spectroscopy. If you can do it from the light curve, um, you can save a lot of telescope time because we have a large sample of these stars for the very first time. So this, this stochastic low frequency variability is a, a direct probe of uh, stellar evolution, which I think is a very exciting prospect. 
Now, bringing it back to that macroturbulent broadening, here's another example of how you can uh, better fit a spectral line if you include macroturbulence compared to only rotation. And on the right-hand side are, uh, is uh, a few figures from uh, one of Connie Ertz's papers uh, in 2015. Uh, so simulated line profile variability in, in a massive star um, based on uh, gravity waves. And on the right is what you actually see in observations. So for all of you who work on binaries and you want to find uh, uh, RV variability because of a binary companion. This is what you're up against. Uh, stars are intrinsically variable in their spectral line profile, uh, and the, the line gets skewed and perturbed, and we can extract the statistical properties of line profile uh, to, to identify the modes that are causing that variability. But what we find is actually uh, that the amplitude of that macro turbulence, that, that line profile uh, variability broadening mechanism, uh, is nicely correlated with the amplitude of the waves and the frequency of the, the waves that we see in photometry. So conclusion one is essentially that we find the stochastic variability is a good way of probing masses and ages amongst the massive star regime, um, which typically do not have these large-scale coherent oscillations, but more stochastic oscillations. And the second conclusion is that the, the variability is correlated with the macroturbulence, uh, which me implies at least that there is a, uh, a common underlying mechanism uh, as both waves in photometry and waves causing macroturbulence uh, have these predominantly horizontal velocities near the surface of a star. So this is, this is the state of the art for the, the massive star regime. I'm going to go a little bit lower in mass now towards the uh, slowly pulsating B stars. So remember those stars that are between three and nine-ish solar masses. Uh, and I've called this section precision modeling, uh, but this is the, the true forward seismic modeling exercise that a lot of people in Connie's group are working on. But I have to mention the, uh, the excellent work from uh, a former PhD student of Connie, who is my Pedersen, who's now in KITP, who I'm going to go see next week. Um, and so she's looked at a sample of about 26 uh, slowly pulsating B stars. You can see the uh, distribution in the HR diagram on the left here. Uh, so we have stars that cover the mass range and the, the width of the main sequence. And on the right-hand side, it's a little bit of a busy plot, but in gray is the, is the Kepler light curve of one of these stars. In blue behind it is the amplitude spectrum. You can see all these beautiful peaks. Uh, they seem to be almost equally spaced in period. And the bottom panel on the right here kind of proves that to you, because if you identify all of those periods and you create your period spacing pattern, they line up and form this sort of uh, almost linear, but let's say call it sort of pseudo-linear uh, trend in the period spacing pattern. And so we can actually model these stars. As I said, the forward modeling exercise is to simply find the observed period spacing pattern, which is a little bit difficult within itself, but once you have it, uh, you can create a grid uh, of stellar structure evolution code, so my used MESA, for example, and then you can calculate what the expected pulsation frequencies should be, and she did that with a code called Jaya, uh, and then you do a forward modeling exercise between the periods of the, the theoretical and the observed uh, uh, periods. She actually went one step further, and for the first time looked at, as I said, the shape of the mixing profile. So instead of just taking some standard uh, prescription as implemented in, in many codes, uh, she actually looked at the effect of changing it. And so there are various um, uh, shapes, as I said, that you can do here. One of them in the top le left here, this is what we call phi one. So phi just means a set of physics. Um, and you've got the convective core shown here in gray. This is just a schematic. And then the overshoot region here, which is uh, diffusive exponential, so it has this sort of gradient to it in blue. And then the radius of envelope is shown here in green. So you've got a few free, free parameters that you can change here. Uh, and of course, there's correlations and degeneracies between that, and we need to deal with that statistically. But you can uh, cast your eye over the different sort of shapes that you can include. Um, and you might think, well, they all look a little bit the same, right? I mean, you've got a gray bit, you've got a green bit. But actually, they have a huge impact on the pulsation modes. As I said, those G modes are very sensitive to the near core properties. And so what seems like small changes here in this schematic actually result in large changes in, in, in the, the theoretical frequencies, which we can then directly model. Uh, so we can essentially say for each star, which of these eight uh, prescriptions works best. And so a pipeline here is just to say that we have the light curves. Uh, we usually use temperatures and log G or luminosities to delimit the parameter space. But once you have that forward mo modeling exercise in place, you are able to extract masses, ages, all of these different things with a very high precision. This is what the results look like. Uh, so this paper was actually published in uh, Nature Astronomy earlier this year, so I encourage you to have a look at it. Um, so again, a little bit of a busy plot, but for each star is represented by a line. Uh, so there's 26 lines across the eight different panels, and it's color-coded by the central hydrogen content. So stars start off being at the ZAMs in yellow, and they end up at the TAMs in a sort of bluish-purple color. 
Uh, and you can see most stars seem to favor the convective penetration prescription for, for overshooting and vertical shear mixing in the envelope, but not all of them. So there is a diversity in not only the shapes, but the amount of mixing and the size of the, uh, the overshooting region, uh, all of these different things, uh, in a relatively small parameter space. So you imagine that stars of three to nine solar masses are kind of boring, right? And they all do the same thing, but that's clearly not the case. There's a diversity here in the physics, and we need to understand why. Now highlighting some of the work that uh, formed the basis of what I want to talk to you about uh, earlier this year, I'm going to draw your attention to Matthias Mikkelsen's paper, also published earlier this year. So Matthias uh, looked for, uh, in, instead of looking at a large sample of stars, he did a very, very, very good job at looking at one star, uh, a very good example of a slowly uh, pulsating B star. And what I haven't mentioned before now is that what we've moved beyond uh, in the astroseismology group here in K, K Leuven is we are not no longer using chi-squared as a merit function in your fitting. And that's because chi-squared doesn't include any of the correlations or the uncertainties uh, within, your, uh, within your theory, within your models. Um, it only does a best fit in the, in the very frequentist uh, sense. So we've moved beyond that where you're actually using the Malahanobis distance, which does include the theoretical uncertainties within your model grid and does include the parameter correlations and generuses amongst them. And so to show you what the, uh, the distribution of best fitting parameters looks like in a chi-squared scenario, this is what we're looking at on the left. So this is a, just a corner plot uh, demonstrating the various parameters that we, we often try and constrain. So you've got your, your overshooting your in two different formulations here, envelope mixing, which is the DM for the mass, the metallicity, all these different things. But if you actually use the Malanobis distance, it is much, much, much better. And that makes perfect sense. If you're able to include the covariance structure of your, of your models in your fitting process, you're actually able to break those degeneracies much, much easier and find the best fitting model. And so just showing you here that uh, if you use chi-squared in your fitting procedures, uh, there are other things out there that can help you. Uh, so if you're struggling to find the best model, uh, the statistical te textbooks actually are very, very useful. So what we've actually done more recently now, which is a paper that I worked with Matthias uh, on and has just been accepted, so you should find it on archive as of last, last week. Uh, still with the same star that I just showed you, this very good example of a, a slowly pulsating B star observed by Kepler. Uh, Instead of uh, pretending that the observations are perfect uh, and focusing on uh, the problems with the models, let's say, uh, we've actually flipped the problem around. So now we've said, okay, we trust the models. They're, the answer is in there somewhere. That's what Matthias showed uh, in his paper that he led. Now we're going to say, that what can we do better from the observational perspective uh, to actually improve the precision uh, and get better constraints on the, the physics of the star? So actually, uh, what a lot of people in my area of expertise in astro seismology never really talk about because it's it's kind of mundane and they want to get to the physics, is the data reduction. Um, you just think that these light curves are just magically appeared, but actually there's a lot of steps in extracting useful data, and that's in all areas of science. But what I'm showing you here is three different data products that are available if you want to look at uh, light curves uh, for, uh, for stars in the Kepler field. Uh, so there's simple aperture photometry in blue, there's the pre-data search conditioning version of the simple aperture photometry in red, and then if you extract your own light curve, it is in green. And of course, there is a spectrum of choices that you can do uh, in all those things. And what we have done here is instead of um, using one set of observations, so one period spacing pattern, we've treated it a little bit more probabilistic and said, OK, let's perturb in a standard Monte Carlo-like scenario, let's perturb the observations within their uncertainties and then try and find a cloud of solutions within the models as a way of probing what the true uncertainty regime uh, is for the, for the best fitting uh, model. And so what you're sh shown on the right, top right here is the, the truth, let's say, um, in black, and then the perturbed solutions within their uncertainties, taking into account all of the data reduction uncertainties that we, we usually just brush under the carpet. Uh, but now if we propagate them forward, uh, you can see that the blue has the worst scatter. Uh, the red is better, but the green is, is, is a lot better as well. So this, this scatter, this residual uh, delta p-value, uh, is uh, actually quite small. Uh, so conclusion number one from this is that you shouldn't always trust the data reduction. For your particular science case, you should create the data set that's best for you. That kind of sounds obvious. Um, but in the case of pulsating stars and, and uh, extracting light curves, the custom apertures, the custom data reduction is, is the best way to go. What this does to the modeling parameters, so uh, remember I, I perturbed the period spacing pattern within its uncertainties. I'm showing you the best three models from those 100 perturbations now. Uh, and here are the fitting parameters again. So this is kind of like a corner plot, but in only one dimension. 
I don't know what that's called, a line plot. Um, so you've got mass, metallicity, envelope mixing, uh, the overshooting, and the, the uh, core hydrogen contents there. So these are the three best solutions. Uh, the dot represents the, the best fitting value, and the solid line represents the uncertainty region that you would calculate based on Bayer's theorem uh, for the distribution of uh, likelihoods within the model. If it's a solid line, that means we are pretty confident that's what the answer is. If it's a dotted line, it means that only one model is returned within its own uncertainty region. So we take the step size in the grid as being the upper limit on the uncertainty. So it usually just means that the, the grid is, is not so finely sampled to get, a, uh, to get a very, very precise value. But these are really, really small error bars, right? So if you're looking at masses of single stars, you can see here that we're, we're talking on precision of, what's that, 0.1 solar masses on a three solar mass star. I think that's pretty good. Um, Metallicity also is a bit shaky because of those degeneracies, but you can see that we can fairly well constrain it. And this is uh, with uh, um, a broad range of values, so we're making sure that we sample everything. But conclusion number two from this is that if you actually tailor the, the models more specifically to the problem that you're trying to solve, you actually get a much better solution. Again, one of those kind of obvious things after you've done it. Um, but if you use six parameters, and what I mean here is that two prescriptions for the overshooting in, in the massive star, uh, so the, the convective core doesn't have this boundary, it's not rigid, uh, material can overshoot from that and then it induces mixing. If you use a combination of both a step and an exponential, uh, you actually do a much better job at constraining the parameters, but the more important conclusion is you do a much more consistent job at fitting the parameters, because you can see here the three best fitting solutions in the six parameter setup after propagating forward all of those ob observational uncertainties are all exactly the same and the errors are all smaller than the grid size. So what we conclude from this is that this prescription, whilst penalizing for the uh, extra parameter, uh, is actually a better way of constraining the core parameters, which these G modes are extremely good at doing. On the right-hand side, I'm showing you the distribution in core mass values that we get from those 300 per perturbed period spacing patterns. And you can see that it's much narrower and much more consistent when we use the six parameter approximation. Uh, so we make a, a fairly strong conclusion from that, that the six parameter is, is a more robust and also uh, consistent way and self-consistent way of uh, modeling uh, stars. Okay, that brings me relatively to the end. I've been talking for 36 minutes. Um, plenty of time for questions, but I want to conclude. Uh, so I've talked to you a little bit about astroseismology. Uh, I've mentioned that astroseismology using Kepler-like curves, we are able to constrain not only the interior rotation, based on rotational splittings or from period spacing patterns. Uh, we can also constrain the, the mixing parameters. And we find for a, a relatively large sample of stars, uh, for the very first time, uh, that the overshooting value is not the same for every single star. It is not necessarily correlated with the rotation. And the same is true with the, with the envelope mixing. We get a large range of values, and this is a log scale for the envelope mixing, so that's five orders of magnitude difference uh, for stars that are relatively similar in mass, age, and chemical composition. I've also, also talked to you about massive star variability being quite diverse. Not only do we see these coherent oscillation modes, we for the first time find that most of these massive stars are stochastic oscillators as well, and we find very good evidence that the, the oscillations originate, originate from the border of the convective core, and they propagate towards the surface. And we find this because it's supported by the spectroscopic uh, uh, constraints on macroturbulence and the photometric constraints on the stochastic low frequency variability. And could together now with a better treatment for observational uncertainties and a better treatment for statistical properties of, of fitting your models, we actually get precision in some stars that can reach off the order of 1% in things like mass and age. I think that's absolutely fantastic to do for a single star. Um, even the best eclipsing binary cases uh, get down to about 2 to 3% in, in uh, precision on mass. So astroseismology is really rivaling that now, which I think is fantastic, and only possible because of the space telescope data. Uh, so we're very grateful to all the uh, instrument teams and engineers that have gone into building that. On the right here, I just like showing this plot because uh, this is uh, from a telescope proposal led by Sergio Simon Diaz. A very pretty plot to show that we are actually comprised, for the first time, comprising a very large sample of massive stars. Um, even though they're quite rare, uh, they're also very difficult to study sometimes, massive stars, because they tend to be quite bright. Um, so telescopes in particular don't always like looking at them. Uh, but Sergio has been very good at collecting a, a large number of spectroscopic uh, observations for, for OB-type stars. And so 
I spoke to you about um, SBB stars. They all fall below this plot. They're falling off the edge, unfortunately. But we are now uh, moving up in mass and being able to constrain uh, stars up to about 20, 25 solar masses, which I think is a great uh, parameter space to be in, because these are the progenitors of the supernova, the neutron star progenitors uh, that we really, really want to, uh, to, to constrain the post-main sequence evolution of. And with that, uh, I will thank you for your attention. I'm very happy to take any questions. I have no idea how online people ask questions, though. Up to 1%. That's going to need a, 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 an elaboration, I think, Hans. How do I know? Mm -hmm. No, that's true. That's why it's a precision, not an accuracy. Yes, so it's... it's and I, I actually conclude the opposite. So it's precise at the 1% level, but it's not accurate at the 1% level necessarily. Uh, so that's a very good point. Uh, and this is also a problem within eclipsing binaries, is that the precision uh, uh, can be very, very high, but the accuracy is not necessarily very high. Yep. And your second question? Yep. The, the, the answer to why there's a diversity, we're not totally sure about. But of course, there, there is a, lo a strong amount of uh, theoretical prediction that if you have a more rapidly rotating star, then you would expect more rotational mixing, for example. We kind of see correlations in there. Um, so we have, uh, I, I think we would need a much larger sample to say that for sure. But there is, if I go back to the, um, the results of Mai's paper, for example. So there, there is a, uh, a sort of consensus, let's say, that stars behave similarly, uh, but in terms of the range, not necessarily, no. So we, we, have, uh, we have some work to do, I think, on finding more stars that, that can fill this plot. Um, to some extent, it does, because if we, if we create these eight grids of models, they have different physics ha having gone into them as prescriptions. So, for example, some of them do have rotational mixing and some of them don't. Um, so you can say that most stars uh, pr prefer vertical shear mixing, for example, um, but most stars, for example, are not in favor of, I'm just going to pick something out here, so the Myriad, 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 I can't say that word, uh, that one at the bottom, um, that's not seemingly to be a very favorite uh, amongst the sample of stars. Whether that's conclusive, I'm not sure, with only a few stars, but um, that seems to be the trend of where things uh, indicate. Yes. So this, you can think of this as a set of prescriptions that go into calculating the models. So it's, it's eight completely independent grids of models. So what we're doing here is actually a model selection problem rather than a direct fitting uh, problem within the eight. Right. Yes, sorry, yes, I should repeat the question, yeah. So, so th this, yeah. So, th so this is a question about the how do you interpret the the, the shape of the profile, right? Um, so, so the the these are profiles that are set by, for example, either a hydrodynamical simulation or or purely analytical um, expectation of what the for a given set of physics what it should look like. And what my did is then take those profiles, vary them within a range of parameters, and include them in the evolution uh, uh, models. So in Mesa and then do the fitting from that. So in terms of the shape, that is, the shape is just purely set by the physics of what you'd expect. Of course, with the caveat of it being in one dimension. Um, the, these ones, you mean? Left. These ones? Oh, sorry, here, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so the, this is a good point. Um, so this is something that, that needs to be improved because not all predictions of, for example, vertical shear will have that drop in that particular location 
for every stage of evolution and for every mass. This is just a, a schematic representation for, for a given mass at a given age, this is what the profile is seen because of the shear mixing and the vertical shear that is inside the star. Uh, but of course, those, re those regions, those shear mixing layers will move uh, as the star evolves. That is a good question, and that that what that is what keeps me up at night. So, um, so the question is. Uh, the overshooting may change as a function of evolution. So how do we, how do we test that? And so, it, it, yes, it absolutely does. But these overshooting parameters are scaled by the pressure scale height. So in that sense, they are changing as a function of evolution uh, by, that, by that scaling factor. But that might say that the scaling factor of the scaling factor might change as a function of evolution. Uh, the short answer is that that is a very complex thing, and we don't have a very good prediction of what that should be. But for example, Matthias is going to be doing lots of uh, hydro simulations, uh, taking MESA models as input put into the hydro, looking at different stages of evolution to see if we can essentially interpolate between these steps in his grid of what the overshooting, the FOV value should be for a young star versus an old star. Um, then the hope would be then to have this as some sort of cyclical or iterative process of fitting uh, between 3D hydro and 1D star evolution. Um, good luck, Matthias. I agree. Go ahead. Okay, so the, the question is that, as you can see on the figure here, most of the stars are on the main sequence, right? So they spend 90 to 95% of their time there. Uh, but what we really want to know is what the stars in the Hirschsprung gap are actually doing. Uh, and the way to tackle that is actually to get extremely good constraints on main sequence stars. Um, because once you, as I said, put those anchor points at the terminal age main sequence in specific uh, quantities such as the helium core mass, if we know that the maximum and minimum helium core mass of stars within a certain mass regime have to be between these values, that then delimits the pro pro possible uh, evolutionary pathways beyond the main sequence. But of course, that being said, there are stars in the Hirschsprung gap. There are more stars in the Hirschsprung gap than we think there should be. Um, and that comes from the possibility of stars undergoing, for example, blue loops. So again, their interior mixing, their binary evolution, their mass loss prescriptions, all of these things contribute to trying to keep stars in the Hirschsprung gap before coming a red supergiant, or after they have become a red supergiant, they return to the blue, they undergo what's called these blue loops, uh, and they are, they are kept there for longer than they should be. And that's because we don't understand the properties there. And so what we want to do, and what, what uh, we're starting to do for the first time, is astro seismology of blue supergiants uh, in large numbers, uh, because then we can actually directly constrain uh, the properties there, compare them to what we get for the main sequence, and then join the dots together. Yeah, sure. Uh, yes. No, I, I, I think Marvel is going to be a big contributor. Um, of course, the, the reason I mentioned CubeSpec here is just uh, because I think it needs a lot more advertising, especially within IVS and the, the wider world. Uh, you're smiling because you know why I say that. Um, Look, there's a backup slide on it. Who thought? Uh, so CubeSpec is actually a, a mission that is being designed here in IVS. Thanks for the planted question there, Yoris. That worked out really well. Um, and so CubeSpec is going to purposefully target massive pulsating stars in the, uh, in the upper mass regime. Um, and so this gives us the opportunity to gather time series spectroscopy. All of the results I've pretty much been talking to you about today are from time series photometry. 
Uh, and that can only take you so far. It's a pretty good way of getting uh, data for asteroid seismology. But time series spectroscopy gives you constraints on the velocity field, whereas photometry gives you constraints on the temperature variability at the surface. And if you have both of them together, you can actually map out the physics a little bit more uh, precisely. And um, what you're seeing here on, on the right-hand side of the screen which is actually over there for you, um, uh, is, is the line profile shifting in time uh, from the effect of the pulsation uh, coming in and hitting the line profile. So you get this beautiful sort of uh, grayscale plot where you see the, the, uh, the, the, the profile changing. Um, so from that, we can actually extract the geometry and the, the line profile moments uh, to actually uh, identify what type of pulsation modes we have, which is then another constraint that we can include in the monitoring. But of course, uh, we also need things like temperatures and log Gs and, and the, uh, the more standard uh, spectroscopic parameters, I would say. And of course, Marvel will contribute to that, absolutely, yeah. Thanks, everyone.